السلام علیکم in our series of lecture for uh, for the subject of uh, mechanics of machine and theory of machine we are on the topic of in gears uh, so for this this presentation we will talk about the gears actually uh, which are very important component for most of mechanical uh, systems um, i'm quite sure you will be a little bit familiar with the gears and of course you will come across many different kinds of gears and uh, its designing process in your near future different modules so i will just go with the brief introduction and we will slowly build up the theoretical background of the gears uh, the important things so why why we need gear so the first question is let the wheel for example is one of the example as shown over here uh, so the gears are quite widely used to transmit power from one shaft to another shaft so you have a rotary motion at one shaft and you want to transfer that to another shaft uh, you, you you need a gear assembly there are many different ways to transfer that power such power uh, from one shaft to another shaft gear is one of the most effective way uh that's why we have the gearbox in in the cars because they are actually the gears are there which which are responsible to to deliver power from the uh, engine from the crankshaft to the wheels and mid between those you have the gear assembly so gear, gear gears really do quite well in in transmission efficiency so that's why you will always see the gear box in in all commercial Uh, vehicles so let for example uh, uh, this is just to to understand the fundamental concept so let the wheel a be keyed to rotating shaft so this is the rotating shaft so this is rotating shaft and this is a one of the wheel so it does not have any teeth so it is just one wheel so it is uh, keyed to to the shaft you will come across this word key actually so key is is the method to attach the disc or if i say the gear or anything to rotating shaft we do with the use of key and that key is basically done by having a little cross section cut in the in the disc and in the shaft and then you have the medium portion medium uh, interface the key which is called the key that you insert so the purpose of this key is to avoid any relative motion between shaft and the disc so that what is it left a wheel a be keyed to the rotating shaft and the wheel b to the shaft right to be rotated so a is a driver and b is a driven so of course just imagine if they are like closely linked together or they are just just enough in contact so if this moves this direction which is clockwise so of course this will move anti clockwise right so a little consideration will show that when the wheel a is rotated by a rotating shaft because we have this shaft being input so this wants to rotate the wheel a it will rotate will be in opposite direction yeah so this will b will rotate opposite direction the wheel b will be rotated by wheel a so long as the tangential force this is important the tangential force exerted by wheel a does not exceed the maximum frictional resistance between two wheels so just imagine when is moving so what is causing this wheel to move is the frictional force and this friction force is a tangential so tangent is a common tangent between between both so the, both both circles has common tangent so f is equal to mu r so r n is a normal force uh, which you i'm quite sure you have done the in the static module dynamic module uh, where you, you evaluate frictional resistances actually uh, so this driver want to rotate will be as long as it is below this frictional resistance 
let's say if the frictional resistance if if the if the if the forces causing this a overcome the frictional force what will happen there will be slippage over here right so exceeds the friction if the tangential force p that exceeds so this p force which is acting in this direction for example so if it's rotating this way so the p force is causing this force so this what is this p p is is the force which is coming from the driver so driver is causing this downward force and equally opposite you have the friction force friction force is always opposite to the force applied force so now this p exceeds the frictional resistance slippage will take place between the two wheels right so we will have slippage thus the friction drive is not a positive drive so you see this 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 such kind of device is called as a friction drive because the the, the driver and driven both are rotating just because of friction so that's why we call it as a friction drive and it's not a positive drive why why we are is not called a positive drive because it has the possibility of uh, losing contact because of the sliding and uh, it's not making any positive outcome uh, if 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 the friction resistance is less than the applied force so what what what's the what's the solution for this problem now so in order to avoid slipping a number of projections called teeth so what you do you you provide the teeth between both so you 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 provide a teeth so it has been cut teeth like that and it has a teeth like that so shown in figure b so this is one of the examples so this the same thing so you have the driver and driven both motions are same way this one driver clockwise and uh, the follower is a anti clockwise and this is the line of contact but now instead of having the contact by friction we have the teeth so teeth are meshing against each other so when this driver so now you it's a very easy to understand that we will not have any slippage at at this time so this is called the pitch circle pitch circle is the point where where both circles are tangent to each other so they are the meeting one and we will we'll we'll see the terminologies so called teeth are provided in the periphery of the wheel a wheel which fit into the corresponding recess on the periphery of the wheel b a friction wheel with the teeth cut on it is known as tooth wheel so in the very beginning this been called as a tooth wheel uh, or a gear so gear is the one which has the teeth and is circular and it 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 uh, gives you the possibility to drive uh, a follower by input shaft uh, motion from input shaft so power transmission is uh, the movement of energy from its uh, place of generation to location where it is applied to forming a useful work so ultimate goal is to have the useful work a gear is a component within a transmission device that transmits rotational force to another gear or device so that's the, that's the sole purpose we want to transfer the movement or the motion from uh, one to another actually so now there are some classifications before i go towards the understanding the the classifications uh, will actually help you to understand there are different variety of gears that's available of course it depends on the nature of the movement you required so this is the this classification is only based on the axis of the shaft so for example the spur gear so this this animation is quite nice actually you see the, this is the same way the shaft moving this direction clockwise this is anti clockwise and one by one teeth are meshing so when we we, we, we the teeth are interacting each other so that's called as a meshing and this is uh, this is another image actually when where the teeth are shown as a meshed actually so they are they are being connected and uh, this is interesting figure we have we have we have the internal gears so spur gear is the typical example of the gear uh, gears uh, very basic simple gear uh, what is it so teeth is parallel to axis of rotation just imagine now so this is the axis so the, the shaft will go through like that basically so this is the shaft so this is the shaft axis center line i'm driving center line so this is shaft axis so now you see the these teeth 
are parallel to the axis of the rotation. So this is axis of rotation. The shaft rotates like that. So remember this in spur gear, the teeth are parallel to the axis of rotation. And now, so such gears are called spur gear. Very simple. So now we have the transmit, the transmit power from one shaft to another parallel shaft used in electric screwdriver, oscillating sprinkles, wind up arm clock, washing machines and clothes dryer, many more. So as I said, this is one of the very fundamental design of uh, gears and that's why they are widely, widely used and they are widely available in, in market uh, in different sizes depending on the requirement. And this is another type is called as an internal sub spur gear. So this is a further classification. So you see the teeth are cut inside, right? So such such assembly is called as a internal spur gear, but the purpose is same. So this is external. This is internal, for example. So the, the, the transmission of power from one shaft to another shaft, basically, that's that's the sole purpose we, we do actually. All right, so then we have the helical gear. Uh, so in helical gear, the major difference is the teeth on a helical gears are cut at an angle to the face of the gear. So you see very visual expression. So you, you have this, this shaft axis of rotation and the teeth are cut on some angle. So of course this angle is, is one of the characteristics which requires to be done during the modeling. So uh, you can you can when, when you are doing the design of gears in, in next semester or so, you will come across such uh, gear designs where you will optimize the helical angle to find out what's the best suitable helical angle you can keep. So this is like helix and this angle is called helical angle. So this angle is suitable to transmit the given power. So now what is the benefit? Very brief actually. This 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 line diagram actually shows this is axis of shaft, axis rotation and the teeth are uh, this one. So as I said, this has each teeth has some angle. This is called helix angle psi, for example. Uh, so the what, what is the benefit on our spur gear? So this is basically this is gradual engagement makes helical gears operate much more smoothly and quietly. So you see this is the important thing over here. So a smoothly and quietly because you just imagine because when you are moving, the gears are moving. So it is gradual engagement. Gradual means slowly interact instead of spur gear with uh, we have like immediate load is on each teeth. For example, when this teeth comes in into into action, so whole teeth is in comes into contact with the driver. But here it is more like a it starts from this end, for example, and slowly goes to this end. So it's like a gradual uh, engagement. So this gradual engagement, this this is what, what this word is used here. So this gradual engagement happening in the helical gear will makes it smooth and quietly. One interesting thing about helical gear that if if the angles of the gear teeth are correct, they can be mounted on perpendicular shaft adjusting the rotation angle by 90 degrees. We have some visual for this one as well. So if it really depends because helical angle is, is the one which can can operate. So if uh, the uh, teeth are correct, the, the angles of the gear teeth are correct, they can be mounted on perpendicular shaft, right? So perpendicular shafts mean you have one shaft. We have one shaft this way, one shaft this way. So if you need one gear over here, one gear over here. So the helical angle are in such a way that they are, they can rotate the perpendicular uh, axis basically. So this is another crossed axis helical gears. So crossed axis helical gear or spiral, spiral gear are sometimes used when the shaft center line are neither parallel or not intersecting. For example, in this example, this is set of like two examples are shown. So you got this one driver. So now you imagine the teeth are in such way. This is what 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 we, we was talking about over here. 
so the teeth are designed in such a way that you see the sh this shaft is 90 degree to the original right so this shaft is 90 degree to original so so this the, this is driver for example and this is the driven so this is driven and this this assembly shows a, a bearing so normally with a gear you have the bearing actually um, so it depends on the assembly actually or the type of the gear as well and uh, so this is called the thrust rotation and hand relation for the crossed uh, uh, helical gearing so thrust basically is the one where you have so whenever you have the helical angle it's, it's, if, you, if you try to understand the the benefit of uh, spur and and helical gear so of course this is like a straight engagement right so they when you these gears are meshed together we don't feel any force towards this direction or this direction so if left side you, this is the shaft so this direction and this direction we will not have any force but if let's say you got this one this engagement is try to push the gear for example in this way it really depends or this way it depends on which direction they are being moving so you have the axial forces so when you have axial forces how to avoid the gear to sustain on the shaft one of the way is to apply bearing and such bearing are called a thrust bearing because they are avoiding the thrust so because when you're moving this gear wants to move back to come off the shaft and we have one of the bearings supporting that axial force this called as a thrust bearing for example so this helps to avoid any disengagement of the gear from the shaft so these are these are uh, some visuals just different assemblies so right hand and left handed um, but it really depends many different examples so yeah so it, it really depends the, the the application nature of application actually but the, the the message from this slide is in cross helical gears you have the possibility of uh, gear shafts at any angle actually so it could be any at, at at any angle and the gears can gear helix actually the angle will define and will help us to 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 perform the function all right then we have a next design of the helical gear called as a herringbone gear so which are normally called as a double helical angle so these these are called as a double helical as shown here so one helix is this one on each gear one helix is this one so of course when they're meshing so the, the, the if this is herringbone so this must be the herringbone as well and uh, comprises teeth having both at right and left handed helix cut on the same gear blanket blank so you have on the same gear you have right and left helix together one of the primary disadvantage of single helix so why we need this herringbone as i said the thrust is one of the important thing because you the shaft has axial force coming from the single helical gear so in this case we will not have the effect because in single helical gear the axial thrust loads that must be accounted by the design of bearing so we need a bearing whenever you use single helical gear you have to have a thrust bearing but this can be avoided how can be avoided by double helix so what does this mean so if you have the axial shaft this way for example this is the axial this is the axis of shaft so if this is axis of shaft so you got thrust let's say because of these teeth the thrust is this way but this the other one the opposite helix is causing opposite so double helical angle or double uh, the herringbone gaze actually avoid the possibility of thrust bearing uh, the, the, the need of thrust bearing because you are actually uh, avoiding any cause of thrust force. So in addition, the, the desire to obtain a good overlap without an excessively large face width may lead to the use of comparative, comparatively large helix angle, thus producing even higher axial thrust. These thrust loads are eliminated by herringbone configuration since the axial force of the right hand half is balanced by the left hand shaft left hand half 
so instead of using the bearing the herring bone the double helical gear is actually avoiding any thrust by both helix so right hand half and left half will counteract with each other actually all right so now the another interesting example is uh, about rack and pinion so rack and pinion is uh, <clears throat> yeah the way it's been shown so rack and pinion is used to convert rotation into linear motion so this this animation is interesting so the reciprocation motion is converted to linear so you see this this one is reciprocating and this one is rotary so very simple wherever you need such mechanism uh, you can you can use such assembly right so now this is like this is the, this rack and pinion which is shown here in the animation this is the spur gear so you see the teeth are straight as like in this gear but here they could be an helix as well so you see this this, this there are different variety of here right so the straight one is called the rack and the gear is called pinion so the, the small gear which is this one is called pinion and the linear the one which is moving linearly is called the rack so a perfect example of this steering system on many cars i'm quite sure you know that in in most of this steering mechanism in different uh, new vehicles uh, they have power or electric steering systems power steering system but in old designs, we used to have the rack and pinion. So you just imagine this is your steering wheel attached to this one, this moving shaft. So moving shaft, your you have the steering, and this lets the wheel to to move that way. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm not sure if uh, I think Merhon still has this rack and pinion example uh, kind of system for the steering mechanism. Then we have a bevel gear. So when rotational motion is transmitted between the shaft whose axis intersect. So this is a particular example where the shafts are intersecting. Some form of bevel gear is usually used. Bevel gears have pitch surface that are cones with their cone axis matching the two shaft rotation axis as shown in figure. So for example, this has some certain cone angle, right? This is form of like cone, right? So this is like, this is also cone. So this has a cone angle like that. So this angle is called cone angle, for example. The gears are mounted on the apex of two pitch cones. So th th this is like different cones and uh, they, they're intersecting at a certain point and the gears are mounted on that one basically, right? Uh, two pitch cones of the coincident with the point of intersection of the shaft. These pitch cones all together roll together without slipping so these kind of like cones they move and you will they, they, they move without any slipping and for example this one with the lego blocks actually is this is this is good animation uh, this is a typical example being shown in differentials uh, if you don't know about differentials they are using cars uh, for transmission so just just google it you will have plenty of uh, uh, designs mechanisms shown for the differentials and uh, also bevel gears are often made of an angle 90 degree so most of the time because you see this this one and this axis and this axis has a 90 degree for example here also this is this axis and this axis like 90 degree so between the shaft they can be designed for almost any angle so bevel gears can be can be designed such a way that they could be at any angle. When the shaft intersection uh, angle is other than 90 degree, that their gears are called angular bevel gears. So this is another example of or subcategory of bevel gears. So bevel gears, if the intersecting shaft is intersecting shaft is is other than 90 degree, it's less than 90, more than 90. In both cases, is called as an angular bevel gear. For the special cases where the shaft intersection is angle is 90 degree and both gears are equal size, such gears are called meter. 
right so meter gears the, 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 the category this category or this name is only valid when you have the gears of equal size so they're equal size and you have the intersection angle is 90 right so if they're 90 and they're equal they're called meter gear and a pair of meter or miter gears are shown in this figure for example this one is is one of the miter gear basically then another other example is warm and warm gear so <clears throat> warm gears are used when large reductions are required right this is important large gear reductions are required it is common for warm gear to have reductions of 20 to 1 and even up to 300 to 1 what what is this number 20 to 1 so if this gear is moving <coughs> at one revolutions per minute right so this warm is moving 20 revolutions per minute and in even some cases is this number if this moves a one revolutions per second for example this has 300 revolutions per second so you see <coughs> or it could be opposite so if this one is a driver if this one is driver and this is driven so this is called as a reduction gear so you are reducing the speed right so if this you're reducing the speed what does it mean you're reducing by 300 times so if it's moving like uh, like for example 300 revolutions per minute so this will move only one revolution this is a great reduction so warm gears are major majorly used to reduce or increase the speed basically so many warm gears have an interesting property that no other gear has the warm can easily turn the gear but the gear cannot turn the warm yeah so the warm can easily turn the gear so we the, the warm actually can turn the gear, but the gear cannot turn the warm. Yeah. So basically, the driver is need to be warm. The warm has to be the driver, and then the gear needs to be driven. Yeah. So the 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 the, the example I was explaining. So for example, this one is required to be moved 300 revolutions uh, per minute for example to have one revolution per minute so you can go cannot go other way so uh, warm gears are used widely in material handling transportation machinery machine tools automobility See, there are many applications especially in the <coughs> in the transportation and in the in the handling material handling conveyor belts are one of the one of the good example so uh, yeah when we do some problems, you will see that uh, there are different ways to to apply the theory for warm gears. So now uh, the gear trains. The word gear train defined as one of the one or more gears are meshed together to transmit the power between the driver and driven. So instead of using one gear, if you have multiple gears, this is called as a gear train. In simple words, if if let's say you have one gear to one gear transfer that's simple gear but if let's say you have multiple gears to transfer power it's called as a gear train uh, the, 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 the watch actually uh, hand watch or, or clocks they have the assembly of different gears where different uh, motions like in seconds minutes and hours are transferred uh, and they are done by using uh, gear trains So it is also called the train of tooth wheel. I said a gear can be called as a tooth wheel, so you can call it as a gear, uh, the train of tooth wheel. Following are different types. So there are different types, a simple gear train, compound gear train, reverted gear train, epicyclic gear train. So we'll do one by one. So a simple gear train, a simple gear train consists of only one gear on each shaft as shown in the figure below. So you got, you got like one driver, and one driven that's it right the gear one is transmitting the motion to gear two so the gear one called the driver and the gear two called the driven or follower so very simple the one one two one two one assembly but let what happens if you have intermediate says so in, in case of b 
you have another intermediate gear so this one drives this way so this will help you to drive this way and then of course this will drive to this way right so you have three gears assembly together so this was this is still driver and this is driven or follower if let's say instead of one intermediate you have two so this rotate this direction this rotate this direction this rotate opposite direction and this rotate. so this one and this one has been rotated in a opposite direction physically so here in, in if you have one intermediate so this one and this one is, is the same so now you you can imagine why we need such assembly the reason is if let's say the gears and the shafts are far away right if the shafts are far away you have to use such assembly to intermediate gears or else you want to reduce speed or increase speed for example you have such assembly you you use such conversion in this in this category and then you have another conversion this way so in in this in such cases you want to reduce the speed by using intermediate gears and the speed ratio can be calculated by using this one where n is is the speed n1 over n2 into n2 over n3 could be written as in form of number of teeth so t2 t3 t1 is the number of teeth for example in each gear set so this particular equation is for b basically so this 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 is for such such case where you have three gears actually not the four then we have compound gear train so in the uh, simple gear there will be only one gear on on the shaft if there are two gears on the same shaft then it will be compound gear so in each shaft if you have more than one gear this is called compound gear so in previous example we had only one gear attached to each shaft but here you have multiple gears for example how so this shaft for example this shaft so the this shaft one which is a shaft a basically it has just one gear right so this is one gear but shaft b this is shaft B. It has gear two and gear three together. So gear two is small and gear three is large. So both are on the same shaft B. And then shaft C, it has again four and five. So this four is larger and five is also, it's not really small, so it's like kind of similar size and then in D you have one so in the shaft D you have just one gear which is six so in such case so this is driver this is driven and these gears are in intermediate they are compound gears so they are you, you can just imagine you have each shaft being connected with the different gears uh, so when you rotate this one for example you rotate this one it will help to rotate this one because this shaft is rotating, so it is rotating this one. So this will mesh with four gear, and fourth gear is moving with the same number of RPM as a five, because they are on a single shaft, and from three fifth to sixth, then it will be different. Right? So, for example, we got, uh, yeah, so this is the speed ratio. So you got T2 over T1, T4 over T. So this is like different ratios you can evaluate to find out the the speed ratio and the gear ratio. This is one of the relation actually. Okay, then we have reverted. So reverted, what is reverted here? So it's kind of like subcategory of compound. Yeah, one more thing. Compound gear trains is one of like very famous example is the gear transmission either in a bike typical cd70 or one to five all of these gear boxes they have the compound gear to transfer power from one to another one and you got uh, in electric vehicles where the gear box is, uh, uh, is is there or commercial all commercial vehicles where you have the gearbox the, the gears are basically compound gear so in each shaft you got uh, the presence of uh, gear the compound gear
Yeah, so reverted gear. So inverted gear train is a uh, reverted gear train is also quite similar to compound gear, but when the drive shaft and the driven shaft are coaxial, then it's called the reverted. So drive shaft and uh, uh, driven shaft. So for example, so this is drive shaft. So this is driver. This is drive, and this is driven. You see. So how, how we actually get getting power? So this gear will this gear will rotate this gear. This gear is attached to this shaft. This shaft will rotate this gear, and this gear will rotate to this one. So both shafts are not connected. Remember. So so basically we have this one process of transferring power from one shaft to another shaft. So you would be thinking why we need such thing? Why we don't have same? Uh, gear basically same shaft this is the this is the mechanism we use for the reverse of uh, of the car for example so reverse gear in the cars so this the, the, because you know the crankshaft has to rotate in in one direction it doesn't move in both direction so how you reverse the car basically if the crankshaft just move in one direction so how you reverse the car you have such assembly with the shift of gear you actually activate the, the reverse gear reverse gear means you activate this reverted gear train and the reverted gear train will help to move this shaft in opposite direction so you shift to reverse gear so in that case the driver will will rotate in such a way uh, the driven that it is in reverse direction so that's the way we achieve the reverse mechanism in the in the in the cars all right so then we have next category is epicyclic uh, epicyclic gear train so when one shaft needs to moved relative to other shaft then the application of the gear is possible as you can see the schematic representation of epicyclic gear train right so there is a center gear for example this is this this diagram is quite well nicely uh, described so you got one of the gear in the center and then you have another gears at different uh, uh, points and uh, there is a possibility as you see this is this this also has internal gear so you just imagine when it moves all gears will move and of course this will move this internal gear cut which is this one so this will move the this this outer one so there are there, there is a center gear called sun gear. So this is like a planetary system. So that's why this, this sometimes this epicyclic gear train called as a planetary gear train as well, uh, where you have in the center, which is called as a sun gear, and the gears around the sun gears are called planetary gears. And the outer ring with the internal gear to think is called the ring gear. So the one which is outer one is called as a ring gear. Uh, together it is called planetary gearbox or epicyclic gearbox. So such assembly is called as a planetary or gearbox or epicyclic gearbox. It's not really common in commercial vehicles, uh, but this is one of the way uh, which has been adopted in automatic gear transmission. So you, you know the these this automatic gear transmission systems are quite getting quite popular nowadays, and most of these ones they have such assembly just to ensure a smooth transmission from one gear to another gear so used by hand or manual gear so in that case it is not like the the gradual or smooth if it's done by itself so you need a sophisticated that's why these automatic transmission gears they have a, a little bit higher cost because of sophisticated gear system gear gear mechanism transmission basically all right then we have few slides on the design nomenclature uh, so I will just go briefly on this one because uh, in next modules when you design of uh, uh, machine elements you have uh, different designing courses you will come across so in that course you will you will design the gear and you will use these terminologies quite a lot so you will have to, to repeat so I'm just briefly going over th those uh, fundamental definitions actually all right so what we have is uh, a pair of spur gears is 
in mesh as shown in figure. The, so for example, this is one of the one of the gear assembly, right? So we got the pinion is name given to the smaller of two mating gears. The larger one is called the gear or the wheel. So whenever two gears are meshed or interacting, the smaller gear is called pinion always. And the larger gear is called either a gear or wheel. The pair of gears chosen to work together is often called as a gear set because the, each gear has to work with another gear. So that's why both are always identified together and they are, that's why they are called as a gear set. All right, so now few 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 definitions. So if you look carefully, so let me explain here, then we quickly go over the definitions. So this is like one of the two of the teeth are shown. So for example, this one, there are two teeth are shown here. So what, what different terminologies we have? The one is called the fundamental, the smallest scale. This is called as a dendrum circle. You got the, the other circle, this one. Yeah, so it has some clearance as well. This is called as a clearance and it has some fillet. This one, this mean teeth been cut over here. And uh, then you have this one. This is called a pitch circle. The most important part is a pitch circle, which is this one, the center line basically. Not really center line, the point which we'll, we'll see where, what is this circle in a moment. Then you have the, uh, yeah, so, so along the pitch circle, you have from here to here this called as a tooth thickness and from here to here it's called width space width of space so it is intermediate space and this one is called as a bottom land So along the circular pitch, along the uh, this pitch circle, so you got the tooth thickness, which is this one, then width of space, then you got uh, the bottom land, so this is the bottom land, and uh, you got uh, the addendum. So what is addendum? From pitch circle to the highest point, this is addendum to the lowest point is addendum. This is called as a top land. So this is the face width. So this is the face width, which is this one. And then you got the face. Yeah, so the, this, this is called as a face. For example, this upper part is called as a face. And the lower part of the remaining teeth to the bottom land is called flank. So these are fundamental things which we will just define in a minute. So the pitch circle, what is pitch circle? Uh, so the pitch circle is a theoretical circle on on which all calculations are based the pitch circle of pair mating gears are tangent to each other so you see the pitch circle is the one which is uh, for example if two gears are you want to show for example the pinion and uh, spur gear if i say like this one uh, over here so for example so the the, the circles which are Tangent to each other, tangent to each other, they, which, which one they are just, just meeting at one single point, they are called as a pitch circle basically. Now we have the diametral pitch. Yeah, this is again, as I said, in designing of gears, you will come across this one. So diametral pitch is defined as is the ratio of number of teeth on the gear to its pitch diameter. So pitch circle, so this pitch circle, which is shown over here. So this is the pitch circle. So it has some certain diameter, right? So that diameter is basically 2R. R is a radius. 
pitch circle radius. So 2R is a diameter. So N over D is called as a pitch diameter pitch. Where N is the number of teeth, R is the pitch circle radius. Uh, note that the diameter pitch cannot be directly measured on the gear itself. Also note that as the value of diameter pitch becomes larger, the teeth become smaller. So just imagine because so for example this one this 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 diagram from theory of machine and mechanism it shows quite interesting so different values for example this is the diameter pitch of four this is five this is six keep going and then you have diameter pitch for example 80 right so you see how small teeth we have on 80 so so what why why we have so so number actually 80 means what does it mean 80 means you have to fit 80 teeth and divided by the diameter, right? So that's why we got so many small teeth. So that's why this diagram is interesting. So what it says, as the value of diameter pitch becomes larger, the teeth become smaller. So you have small number here. So you got, for example, here, this is four diameter. So you have quite large teeth. So you keep reducing it. It will uh, the diameter pitch increasing means number of teeth are increasing. So to fit to the circle, the number, the teeth required to be small size actually. So the diameter pitch is used to indicate the tooth size in US customer unit and usually has units of teeth per unit inch. So this is uh, one of the units you had described, a pair of mating gears has the same diameter pitch. Yeah, so diameter pitch uh, has to be same for gear and pinion. For example, over here, so both gears, gear and pinion. So this small is pinion, this one is gear. So both needs to have similar diameter pitch. The next is the module. M module is the ratio of pitch diameter of the gear to its number of teeth. So 2R and over N. So this is just opposite of diameter pitch. So diameter pitch was N over 2R module is 2R over N. So the module is the usual unit for indicating tooth size in international system units. So SI system actually describes <coughs> modules. And it is customarily has units millimeters per tooth, right? So millimeter per tooth. Note that the module is reciprocal of diameter pitch and the relationship can be written as. So M is basically because this one module is reported in SI units and diameter pitch is re reported in customary unit, right? Teeth per inch. So that's why we have the conversion of 25.4, which is the conversion for millimeter to inch. So both P, M and P are reciprocal, just a little bit of conversion basically. Also note that the metric gears does not, should not be interchanged with the US gears since their standards for both sizes are not the same. So this is another thing, very, very important. If you're having a gears from different uh, companies or manufacturer from US or, or elsewhere, uh, so they should not be combined together. So as I said, normally gears are supplied, provided as a gear set, right? So you need to work out or use the similar gear. So you, you, you need to use one single uh, methodology to describe that. Otherwise, there, there, there might be some, some issue actually. So they are not compatible actually, if I say like that. So then we have the clearance. It is the radial distance from the top of the tooth to the bottom of the tooth in a meshing gear. A circle passing through the top of the meshing gear is known as clearance circle. So what is it basically? So this is the this is the circle which is basically which is from the from the gear itself. And this one, the one this is shown over here. This is basically circle which is being formed. Showing the gear which is in mesh with it. 
so the other teeth will come and it will stay away from it will stay away this much distance from the bottom land just imagine so the other teeth other gear has teeth like that so the teeth is coming sorry teeth is coming like that so it always stays little bit away from the bottom of the this gear right so this clearance between this and meshed gear is called as a clearance right so it is a radial distance so one more thing is a radially measured it's a radial distance from the top of the tooth to the bottom of the tooth in the meshing gear so from one gear is a top top face for one gear and for one gear is a bottom so the clearance or the distance with radial distance is called as a clearance so total depth basically is the radial distance between the addendum and the dendritic circle of the gear right so the addition of these two is the total depth so that's the total depth basically and the dendritic circle of the gear it is equal to the sum of the addendum and dendritic right so this is called the total depth basically uh so the circular pitch is the distance from one tooth to adjacent tooth measured along the pitch circle so from one tooth to another tooth this, this is circular pitch so distance from one tooth to another tooth so if you start from the here you end up the here as well if let's say you want to measure from here it needs to be over here right so this distance how do you measure it so of course the pitch circle this is measured along pitch circle pitch circle has 2 pi r circumference you divide with the number of teeth this will be this distance right if you think about it so this is the circular pitch basically therefore it can be determined from circular pitch is related to the previous definition depending on the units so now you can because module is the one which is can be used which is one of 1 over p diameter pitch so module was 1 over p so p is basically the diameter pitch so the circular pitch is written like that is equal to pi m so if you multiply pi with with the module you will have the circular pitch so it's a very simple mathematics actually and then we have the addendum is the radial distance from the pitch circle to the top land of each tooth and uh, so yeah so radial distance from the pitch circle to the top so radial distance from here to the top is called as a addendum and the radial distance from top to bottom radial distance from the pitch circle to the bottom land of each tooth is called as a dendritum uh, whole depth is being described over here uh, yeah the sum of addendum and dendritum already shown the clearance is the amount of by which the dendritum of a gear exceeds the addendum of the mating gear so just try to focus this one uh, as i explain the uh, the example for the clearance the way i explain so what is it is the amount by which the dendritum of a gear exceeds the addendum of mating gear so when mating gear the meshing gear passes through so passes through so this has this much addendum because it has dendritum upward it has dendritum downward right so this dendritum is larger than the addendum of the meshing gear that larger distance is called as a clearance right this is called as clearance then we have the backlash one important thing the backlash is the amount by which the width of a tooth space exceeds the thickness of engaging tooth measured along the pitch circle so we, by which the width of tooth space exceeds so what is tooth space again <coughs> so tooth space is this one so from here to here is a tooth space so this is the space width of space so how much this is bigger than the 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 tooth thickness of the mating gear so other gears if comes up over here it comes up over here so what what was the case so the this width is needs to be greater than the width of the 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 tooth thickness of the other gear just try to imagine the tooth thickness because if let's say it's is equally same size then they will just 
you have the uh, interlocking so they will not move they will stuck actually so that's why this is called backlash is the amount by which the width of a tooth space exceeds the thickness of engaging tooth so this width the amount this thickness is greater than mating gear uh, width to thickness then the this will be called as a backlash. So now you imagine why we need backlash because we don't want it to stuck actually. But on the other hand, if you have a larger backlash, so this the gear will be noisy because it's a free space. So it will just has gone to noisy. Of course, with the wear, with the regular use of the gears, it will become uh, more like a uh, like you will have higher backlash. So that's why you need to 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 replace the gear, gears basically. Then you have uh, the example for a random circle. So what is it basically? A random circle. It is the circle drawn through the top of the teeth and is uh, and is concentric with the pitch circle. And a random circle is if it is the circle drawn through the bottom of the teeth is called as a. So the one circle which passes through the random is called the random circle, which is shown over here. And the lower one is called a random circle, which is this one. So, uh, yeah, some of these one already explains so what is this pitch circle. <coughs> it is an imaginary circle which, uh, by pure rolling action, would give the same motion as the actual gear. Yeah, so this is the circle when it moves. So it is giving you exactly the same as your actual gear, basically. So piece circle, it has some diameter, the diameter of the piece circle, the size of the gear is usually specified. The piece circle diameter is known as a pitch diameter as well, right? Then you have pitch point. It is the common point of contact between two pitch circles. So this is a point where you have the mating actually of the, of the gears. Common point between the two pitch circle. So uh, as I told you, there is a piece circle for pinion, there is a piece circle for uh, uh, gear or the wheel. So both pitch circle has to meet at just one single point and that single point is called as a pitch point. Then we have the pitch surface. Yeah, so pitch surface, it is the surface of the rolling disc which the meshing gear have replaced at the pitch circle. It's the surface of the rolling disc which the meshing gears have replaced at the pitch circle. So the, the surface formed by the pitch circle is called as a pitch surface. Um, this isn't really like one of this one of the famous definition, but that's okay. Then we have pressure angle, very important. So pressure angle or a angle of obliquity is the angle between the common normal to two gears. Remember these two things. I will show you in the next slide. So common normal to two gear teeth at the point of contact and the common tangent at the pitch point, right? So this pressure angle is the angle between common normal and common tangent. So remember now in both gears you have common tangent and you have common uh, normal and common normal always passes through pitch point and th that angle between the common normal and common tangent is called a pressure angle it is usually denoted by this phi and the standard pressure angles available for different commercial uh, uh, gears are only two 14 and half and 20 degree so these two standard gears are available in market uh, commercially produced these are the two pressure angles are being used so these definitions already done. So working depth done, tooth thickness done, tooth space done. Yeah. So uh, yeah, let me show you the pressure angle basically. Yeah, so it's over here. So what is it basically? So you got, you see, this is one of the pitch circle. This is one of the pitch circle and this is another pitch circle, right? So you see, the, uh, you can you can draw it complete like that, right? And you can this is smaller one, so this is like the pinion. 
and both are meeting at just single point. This is called P pitch pitch point and they have normal which is basically a straight line. So that's the normal and then they have common tangent. So this is the common tangent. So this common tangent is basically this P point and uh, this angle between common common normal and common tangent is, is, is basically psi. So that's one of the because you know when this is the tangent we are drawing this one as a 90 degree over here and showing this particular angle over here. So this would angle uh, at particular pitch point. So because we are we just need at pitch point. So which should be this angle. So this angle and this angle might be same. So I can explain later on this one. So th th that what it says the common angle, the common normal to two gear teeth point of contact and the no common tangent at the pitch point. Then uh, face of tooth is already explained. Face of tooth uh, is the surface of the gear tooth above the pitch sur surface and flank of tooth, which is below the pitch surface. Top land is the surface of the top of the tooth, which is over here. I showed you this is the face. This is the flank already discussed. Then we have the face width is the time is the width of the gear uh, tooth measured parallel to its axis. So face width so it's parallel to axis. So this is the face width. Uh, profile it is a curve formed by the face and the flank of the tooth. So the profile the, the is, is this profile basically. Yeah, so this profile is, is the curve formed by the face and flank of the tooth. Then you have filler fillet radius is the radius that connects the root circle to the profile of the line. This fillet radius I showed you because this is like a circular. It's not like a 90 degree. Instead, it has some angle, right? So it has some angle. So this is like fillet radius. So then we have a path of contact is the path traced by the point of contact of two teeth from the beginning to the end of engagement. So this is this is the contact point basically, right? This is the contact, right? Yeah, this is a contact line. So the length of the path of the contact is the length of the common normal cut off by addendum circle of the wheel and pinion. So this this uh, length of path contact. So common normal cut off by the addendum of the wheel and pinion. So this is the this is the common normal. Which is been cut off by the addendum circle of the wheel and pinion. So addendum circle this line is being cut by this. For example, this addendum is cutting this line over here, for example, right? So this particular line, let me draw again. So let me draw this line again. So this line, which is black line, this is a line of contact which is being cut by, for example, this will be cut by this line over here, right? So this is the addendum circle. So this is the addendum circle is cutting this line of action at this particular point. So it, it, it cuts over here and then the other one from the other circle uh, from this circle it's cut over here. So from here to here is called as a length. So length of the path contact is the length of the common normal cut off by addendum circles of wheel and pinion. And then we have arc of contact is the path traced by a point on the pitch circle from the beginning to the end of engagement of a given pair teeth. The arc of contact consists of parts. So arc of approach and arc of recess. So is a path traced by a point on the pitch circle from the beginning to end of engagement. So as I said, the, the length, path length of contact from here to here is the one which shows how the how, how much contact length we have. And the arc formed by the, the, the by approach to the center line is called arc of approach. And from approach from uh, neutral axis from the common normal to the Cut off point this called an arc of this S.
so this slide actually shows very interestingly actually all so you see this is the addendum circle here this is addendum circle which is intersecting at this particular point from that point you are actually this dot black dot which is shown this is the approaching so this is the point where the contact actually approaches it starts then this is the center point So this is the center point, for example, where the pitch circles, these circles are meeting, maybe a little bit higher. And this is the addendum circle cutting this point over here. And then the other one is cutting over here, right? So this is over here. So this one, the whole this length is called as a uh, path, path length, basically. It's shown over here. So this is shown over here. And uh, yeah, so this is what we, we say. And uh, it's very interesting animation because it shows how teeth loads are being carried out. So you see, for example, this teeth when it's coming, it does not have a load. The loading starts right over here. And this loading ends over here. So this, this, is, the, this is the length where the loading load is being carried out. So that's why this is important. This length is very important. Again, this is the this is the this is the path. This this line blue line is shows a path dash line, and where it intersects the addendum circle cuts by one of the teeth is is the is the approach is the beginning and then it terminates over here. And from the common normal, which is this one, so which is common normal like that, and it has uh, definitely been uh, been the part. And from here to here, the arc formed. This arc formed is called as a arc of approach and this arc of recess basically. All right, so we continue with this one. 